Hey, welcome back to another edition of Inside the Music Biz. My name is Cornbread. For those of you who know me or may not know me, I am a songwriter, producer, engineer with about 38, I think it's 40 years now, 40 years experience in the music industry. Um, I've worked with some of the biggest acts out there, um, written and produced and awesome upcoming acts here. We have this show called Inside the Music Biz, which now takes a look at some of the things that have happened throughout my career, as well as those that are happening to people coming up in the industry. Inside the Music Biz takes a look at the behind the scenes action that makes up the entertainment industry. It's no longer just the music biz, so ignore that name just for a second. The music biz is technically the entertainment industry because it encompasses so many different elements from music, video, film, TV, writing, you name it. All of the things that make up the industry. Uh, actors are getting into singing, singers are getting into acting. You have a cross-pollination of, of novels becoming books. I'm sorry, novels becoming films. Films being uh, made into books. You have all of that synergy that makes the entertainment industry what it is today. So in that light, we're going to be talking on Inside the Music Biz with a filmmaker who is well on his way to becoming a legend here in the city of Detroit. I've had the pleasure of knowing this, this man, Tommy Henry of Dragon Films, uh, more than 20 years now. When, he first, when we first met, he was a cameraman at Comcast on a public access, access channel. And we got to talking about his dream of being in the industry of a filmmaker. And the funny thing is, um, at the time, I really was skeptical about when he was talking about what he wanted to do because I've met so many people that wanted to be in the business but never put forth the effort. And to my great surprise, and I'm glad it did happen, Tom followed through on it. And we're going to be talking about that journey that had begun long before I had met him, by the way, but it kicked off into high gear once we had hooked up. Tom Henry of Dragon Films has put out uh, three movies and now begins his four. First movie was called uh, Uncut, the movie. Second was Act of Vengeance. And the third was recently premiered at the AMC in Fairlane, Fatal Brew. We'll be talking about those, what led up to them, and the workings of the fourth movie. Tom has become so well known and so adept at what he is doing, he's even attracted the attention of the Bollywood industry out of India. Bollywood, as you know, is a play on the word Hollywood, which comes from Bombay and Hollywood, Bollywood. He was sought out to choreograph fight scenes for a movie called The Chase. He's also an award-winning director, recently being awarded the Telly Award, third place bronze finish on his first time at bat. We're going to talk about that as well, how he felt in getting that award, what it means. And one of the things, too, we at... Um, um, Recently, Dragon Films, and myself included, had a show in which we awarded trophies to various actors and actresses who made up the various films. And the amazing thing about that is it's the only known instance of a production company honoring the film, the, the film crew, the actors, everyone who was involved. The Hall of Fame Awards, it was, it was called. And at this award show, Tom himself was surprised that we behind the scenes put uh, an award together named it after him, the Tommy Henry Innovator Award. And this award acknowledges his, his tenacity, his perseverance, his fortitude, and basically the fact he never gave up. There are things that went on in the making of, I've been, I've been privileged to be on part of all three of the films, and there are things that went on you just wouldn't believe that would have made someone like myself just say to hell with this. I, I can't do it, I quit, uh, you folks go home, pack it up, I'm done. Tommy stuck through this with, with, again, the fact that he had made three films happen, put on the big screen, not just direct to video, all three of his movies premiered on the big screen. And the fact that he was bold enough to pull this off, and at times when you hear the story, I'm, I'm still shaking my head on some of the things that happened, how he got his first movie to play at the Renaissance Theater, and we didn't know how he had done it until afterwards, when he shocked us with his method of getting this on the big screen. And one of the things, again, I nicknamed him the Godfather because he's lighting a path that everyone should follow or people who are doing movies should follow. And we've seen that in actors who have went on to other productions, the fact that they learn through Dragon Films, they take that knowledge, and then they go on elsewhere. And again, Tommy is setting a standard that others will follow and that you, as you get to know this guy like I have, you'll be amazed. So stay tuned because we'll be talking about Dragon Films, 
the Hall of Fame Awards, upcoming projects, and of course the casting for his latest movie, Deadly Retribution, which begins, I believe it's in October, the casting for that. So stay tuned and you're going to be amazed at this man's story. We welcome your comments as well. production company that got started back in the 90s. Um, actually got started a little bit before then because we, we this actually goes back to the 70s. Okay. Where we used to uh, work with a Super 8 movie camera. We, you know, and back then the Super 8 movie camera didn't have but 50 feet of film so pretty much there was no room for error. Okay. So we would, I would get a bunch of guys, we'd go in my backyard and and we we practice and practice and practice because we had to have everything down pat. You know, everything had to be perfect because we know we didn't have but that 50 feet of film. So that's how we, it actually got started. And and, and uh, we would use that film which which didn't have no sound. So we had to actually edit sound in back then. Okay. And and uh, so it was, it was a headache. But we would we would we would do it. We'd go in my backyard and just practice, practice, practice for hours. And then when we get ready to shoot scenes, we would go all over the area of the North End, shoot the scenes, even go out to Belle Isle and shoot some scenes. <laughs> so yeah. now, the name Dragon, where does that come from? And give the significance of that Dragon name. I, it, pretty much it comes from me I, because I've been in arts for quite a while. Which, which so arts? Uh, the martial arts. Martial I've been arts. in the martial arts okay. for quite a while. Okay. And, and, and uh, actually, i got about 50 years now. In, in the arts. He's a dangerous man, I see, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, yeah. So, dra Dragon, Dragon, well, so what made you, uh, again, start, want to start a company as opposed to, like, a lot of people took it, because I, I believe you started doing movies in the 70s when the martial arts fad hit the uh, United States, yeah. you know, Kung Fu films, a Chinese Bruce. connection. Bruce Lee. It was Bruce. So yeah. this is what got you into the martial arts, so what made you want to do movie making to be able to say, I can, I can see myself doing this? I had uh, a lot of actors I used to watch, James Cagney, Joan Crawford, Jimmy Stewart, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Humphrey Bogart, all, the, all those actors, I used to watch them, watch how they perform, watch their facial expressions, and, and, and then I would be checking out the storyline, then I would be checking out the credits and all of that, and, I, and I, once I, I just kept looking at that and I kept saying to myself, I can do that. So, so you mean you're a self-taught filmmaker? 
Yeah. No trade for pre professional training whatsoever. No. Okay, so you you are now again for our, for our viewers. You are what? How many movies have you done? Uh, three movies. I'm getting ready to do my fourth. Four movies with no formal training. Yes. And and is is that surprising to a lot of people when they find that out? Yes, very much. Uh, especially the ones that that have went to college and 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 went to <laughs> film school uh, to learn the craft. And and I pretty much was sh shocked when I find out that. I have some people coming to work with me that have been to film school to learn the craft and they come to me to get knowledge about filming and, and, and to work with me on, on filming projects. So all of the stunts, all of the writing, all of the directing, learning lighting, you are self-taught. Yes. So I'm taking that you may have looked online for some videos and that's it. So like YouTube, we call it YouTube University. But even before the days of the internet, how did you learn your craft? Just by watching uh, videotapes over and over again and looking at the you know even before the videotapes came out I used to just watch the movies over and over again look at see what kind of lighting they had figure out what kind of lighting they were using for that particular scene and I used to watch the behind the scenes okay. uh, of how certain movies were made because sometimes that the channel that that shows all the old classic movies they had a they had a tendency to show behind the scenes how these particular movies were made I was always into that big time so it's from, from this you also learn how to do stunts and make believable action scenes, fight scenes. I've seen your movies, you know, I'm biased in this sense, but I like what I see in, in the way that you make the, the, the killing, you make the fights, to make it look like they're actually being hit. How did you come about in doing that? Practice in my backyard. Okay. I used to get all of my friends together uh, and we get in my backyard. I, I, I talk everybody into coming back there. I used to have 30 and 40 people back there at a time and I would be training everybody, showing them how to do stunts, all from me being self-taught myself. I would be showing them how to do different things and we, we'd work on it and work on it and then I'd get the Super 8 camera and go to work. You know, and, and film them doing different things and then if, if it's not right, if I don't think it's right, we'll, we'll do it over and then we'll get out there and practice for several more hours. And, and uh, like I said, after we got done and we got everything the way we want it, then we'll start shooting scenes in the, in the area of the North End or either go out to Belle Isle and shoot our main fight scenes. So um, what, how was it in trying to keep together, a, a, I guess, a group of friends that wanted to do it as a hobby or pastime and make them where they're serious about it or make it where they will come back again? What, how did you get them to stay together? Mainly by me talking with them. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm pretty good at that. I would I would talk them into it and 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 tell them you know that you know that once they once I talk with them, and I get them involved, then they they be right there. Okay. They they they, they just keep coming back, <laughs> and then next thing I know, they bring them more friends that want to get involved. So and that that's how Dragon Field basically evolved. You had yeah. all of these folks that were you say, hey, I can make a business out of this, or I can make a company out of this. Now the key thing you keep saying the North End, the North End. Um, where where did you live at in the North End? Uh, over on Delmar and, and West Minnesota. Yeah, the North End. It was it was the happening place back then. This was what 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 around what time? This now this was back in the sixties. Okay. Yeah, this was back in the sixties. Yeah, and and uh, the North End. That that was the happening place That's where everybody came to party and have fun. And while they were partying. I was training. Okay. Yeah, and uh, because it, because even my friends when I used to, you know, I didn't I didn't go out a lot with my friends, but when I used to go out with them, they would tease me and and uh, you know, especially if I go to a club with them, they you know they'll say, give my boy Tom here a shot of milk. Yeah. You know, they, oh yeah, they used to tease me about that all the time. You didn't, you didn't drink, I take it. No. No. Okay. No smoke. No drink. No smoke. Oh. No. Keep keep the healthiness and all. Now you lived in in um, North End, I believe, with your grandmother. Yes. Uh, and then uh, tell us about her because uh, I'm amazed yes. at at the fact. First, she let thirty to forty people in the backyard, and there's other things we'll talk about as well that just simply surprised me when you told her. But tell us about your grandmother. Yeah. What's her name? Uh, her name is Berina, a name I never heard of before, uh -huh. and and right to this day, I still haven't seen another lady that was named Berina. Um, my my, uh, my my grandmother just let me. I moved in with her after after her husband uh, passed. Her husband had cancer. He he passed. So uh, my father, and my mother let me move in with her to keep her from being there by herself. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, uh, because uh, anything I wanted to do, she was she she was uh, with it one hundred percent. Your biggest supporter, I take it. Very big supporter. Yes. And she taught me everything. Uh, everything. She taught me everything from gardening to cooking. I was. 
She taught me how to cook when I, when I couldn't even see over the top of the stove and she had this footstool for me to stand on to, and she would teach me how to cook certain things and I, and then she'd stand there and watch and if I was doing something wrong, she would let me know. <laughs> They'll burn the house down, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. So again, being, again, I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that there's 30 to 40 kids in the backyard every day, and she didn't have a problem with that. Never said a word. Oh, okay. Never said a thing. <laughs> uh, she would come back in and see who all wanted lemonade or, okay. or something like that, and and I, I I used to play drums. Okay. I, you know, I used to be a drummer. Okay. And and uh, she never had a problem with me. Uh, practicing my drums. Now, now that, that's what I'm going to talk about. You now again to give a little more for those of you out in the audience who know about drummers. Drummers in the beginning are not making music; they're making noise until they figure a rhythm and pattern to make a, a sustainable type of beat. So in the beginning, learning drums, you're, you set it up where in the house? It down in, down in my basement. Okay. I used to do it upstairs. Then I set it up down in the basement. Uh, now my brother. My my my, uh, my brother Gene, he went to school uh, to uh, to learn drums. Me, I I was self taught. Self taught. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, I wanted to learn how to play drums from listening to James Brown, uh, Bernard Purdy, uh, uh, really Purdy. Yep, and yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich. Uh, those two drummers, they 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 turned me on. I, I I that's what really inspired me to play drums. So you would practice in the basement, making all this noise in the beginning. And what did your grandmother do or say? She would go. She would go sit on the front porch, <laughs> and uh, I just. She just. She just. There was one rule that she had. Uh, I couldn't play the drums while the soap operas was on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that what the soap operas and Gunsmoke. Okay. You know when those two shows were on, couldn't play no drums then. You know. And you Other were, than that, she didn't care. And you were playing for hours on the end, on the, and never said a word. She never said a word. That, that, that's, again, that right there, that's amazing because I would have been like, cut that noise out, oh my goodness and all. So again, this, this is why I'm just amazed at this, this woman, your grandmother, what's, what's her name again? Yep, Rena Henry. Yes, it's just amazing about that. So now, one of the things too, you talked about um, in your martial arts training, you're self-taught, and some maybe, well, give us a background on that. Well, I started off in, I started off in Taekwondo. Uh, Saint Kushim. I started off there, but I've seen the, I've seen the, you know, there was, there was something about Taekwondo. It was more, it was more uh, concentrated on the feet. There was, there, it, 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 there was no continuity there. It was more, it was more uh, geared towards your feet and not towards your hands. In, in other words, it, it, it just didn't fit what I wanted to do. You know, because I was going, me myself, I, I had started going up to. The Considine Gym. I don't know if you know that was on Woodward, the Considine okay. Gym, and and uh, uh, I was I was always interested in boxing too. So I would go up there and watch the guys box, and then and then the uh, the guy that that was in charge of the uh, Considine Gym, he started letting me come up there and train. So I started going up there and training with the boxers, and and uh, after I got into the martial arts, I had this big giant garage built. I was going to ask you on that, and yeah. then before you, before you go any further on that. In your grandmother's backyard, mm -hmm. she lets you get a a, a a garage built from the ground up. Yep. But go ahead, talk about that. Yeah. I actually <laughs> got me. I actually got a job at Chrysler, and the, the main reason I got the job at Chrysler was to get that garage. I wanted the garage built because I wanted to open up a school, and mm -hmm. and I was the first guy ever to uh, have a garage built and turn it into a school. Never never parked a car back then, not <laughs> one time. Okay. I I uh, put. Carpet, water wall carpet in there. I put paneling all over all the walls, and I had a, a a heater, a gas heat put in. You know, a gas uh, stove put in there. Okay. And and uh, I started I started my school. So I went up to the Considine, and got all the boxers up there to start coming down to my school. Which is your school have a name? Uh, Cheek Loon Dong. Cheek. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, your grandmother was okay with her backyard being turned into a school. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> and it was funny because you would see all these guys walking down the alley, coming to coming to my school, um, you know, to train. And then I had a bunch of boxers from from the Constantine coming there, and we would do a trade off. Mm. They would teach me boxing moves. I would teach them martial arts. So we would be trading off. So then. Uh, the the uh the guy that was in charge of the Considine, he uh he he found out about it and he came down there. I thought he was gonna be mad at me, but uh, he wasn't. He, yeah, he, when he seen what they were doing, then he he uh he was happy about that. He he was happy. He didn't have no problem with it. 
and and uh, he would come down there and watch sometime, and and I would go back and forth, and and uh, I would, you know they would train there in my school, and then I would go up to the concert and I would train. Well, once I got that, once I got into that, and we were also practicing practicing wrestling moves. Okay. Well, that's what put me ahead of everybody else in taekwondo. And when they seen the stuff that I was doing, they didn't like it. Uh, because I was I was overpowering everybody else when it came to the sparring and stuff. They didn't, yeah, the guy, yeah, the, the instructor told me, that's not Taekwondo you're doing. You know, and, and, and I, you know, I'm like, why does it matter? As long as you get the job done. You know, when, when they got to tell me that I couldn't do this and couldn't do that, I said, it's time for me to move on. So is this like an early version of mixed martial arts? Yes. Okay. Yep. Well, it, was, it wasn't called that back then. No, though. I wasn't called that back then. Okay. And uh, then I, I joined a couple of Kung Fu schools. And 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 uh, you know and you know the kung fu schools you know I tell you they had their limitations as well so I just I just started doing my own thing back then but, you know even though I was steady progressing as far as getting the ranks and stuff that like the ranks was easy to get that was a piece of cake for me okay you know the ranks yeah and once yeah. I got the got up to the fourth rank I just said I didn't there was nothing else fourth that, rank what I mean what, what do you mean by that fourth, fourth degree black oh okay yep. okay so yeah. what is, what is your current do you have a belt now? You're fourth degree. Once you become a fourth, you say a fourth. I take it, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you now? Yeah, that that that. After I got fourth, I just I just went on out on my own and started. Okay. And started, yeah, because I wanted to. You know, it, it was all you know, getting the ranks and stuff. That's good too, but making yourself better fighting wise and getting more knowledge about the about the uh, fighting uh, you know knowledge. That, to me, that was more important. So you know, this than the, than, uh, than the built ranks. So so this is where the background and training the actors for your movies came in. Now yes. what, before we go into that, you started because the the star of the movie Uncut was a guy named Christopher Gilmore, correct? Mm -hmm. And he started working with you in the backyard as a kid. You should train him. Okay, yeah. so we'll get we'll get into that. But that that that's like um, again jumping a little bit ahead, but. Some people basically followed your path all the way into making movies. Others yeah. just said it's a hobby. And you knew that it's serious enough to make a business for you. With some like Chris, they said, I want to do this as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what was it like training amateurs to, um, you know, when we get to the movies, talking about training somebody who has never been in a fight before, who has never did anything in that sense. How did you make the fight scene so believable in your movies? Well, for one, it was awkward to them. It was real awkward to them. And I had to, you know, I told them, I said, let me, let me show you the way it's actually supposed to go. And, you know, I, I would show them how it would be done in a real situation, but I would let them know that movie fighting was totally different. And so I would have to teach them how to sell a punch, how to sell a kick. What do you mean sell it? Yeah, when you, you know, meaning when, when somebody throw a punch at you, you got to know how to turn your head uh, to make it look believable, and the timing has got to be right. You got to turn your head the exact time that that punch come across the face. Your head got to turn it the exact time, because if it don't, it throws everything off. Everything is thrown off. Same thing with the kicks and, and the throwing. If, and, and, and when it comes to editing those scenes, mm -hmm. if I miss one thing, like one second, you don't throw off the whole entire fight scene. Okay. It throws the whole entire fight scene off if you miss that one second when you're editing those things together. So you, you know, it's, 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 it's a certain way that everything has to be done when it comes to doing fight scenes. And, and it, that, that's why I was laughing when I was uh, showing you because when you, when you was telling me that you couldn't do it, I said, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, oh, by the way, pull up just a little, because you're vibrating the keyboard, mm -hmm. and that's shaking on the camera. Mm -hmm. now, now, that's so now, it's more than just simply showing people how to throw a punch, throw a kick. You put them through a stunt camp, an mm -hmm. actual um, stunt camp, where you would teach them falls, kicks, flow. Go, go elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Well, stunt camp basically is pretty much showing everyone how, a, how a, a movie fight scene is supposed to go, how you're supposed to sell a punch and a kick, how you're supposed to do a throw, how you're supposed to roll when you, get, when you, when you hit the ground. All of that is, is, is important. All of that becomes a factor. And, 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 the, and another thing that I always tell people, what's really important, facial expression. Okay. You got, to do, you got to have the right facial expression for every fight scene that you do. I mean, even, even the shooting scenes. You got to have a facial expression. So again, you this is something you picked up from years of watching movies very, very closely. And, and one of your favorite genres is westerns. I take, I believe, right? Yes. Yes. So you learned all of this to be able to transfer it to other people through teaching, just from watching movies. Yeah. And 
I got so good at it that I automatically knew when a stunt man, when the, when they were using a stunt man to take a punch, because when you see the you see the actor when the fight scene get ready to start, but when when that person is throwing a punch at him, once they throw a punch at him, that's where the stunt man comes in at. And, but you don't see the stunt man come in. You just see the stunt man taking the punch. Uh -huh. I automatically know when it's a, when it's a stunt man. I always say, see, see, a stunt man, a stunt man. <laughs> you know, I used, to, I used to always do that, and then. The, and I, and I tell everybody that work with me, I say, once you work with me, you're not going to look at TV the same again. Oh, okay. I always tell them that, and then they, they don't understand what I'm saying then, but after they get through working with me, then they understand where I was coming from. So, I so again, leading up to um, the movies, I mean, we're going to get into that more in depth, but I'm still amazed at your background. So, you got a drum set, you learned how to play, and you went pro, so to speak. You, went, you did go pro, you played in a band and made money, you were a pro. Yep. So tell us about that, because see, these are some of the things, Tom, for those who don't know, Tom is one of the most tight-lipped persons you ever <laughs> meet. He just said, I guess it's from that training, that, you know, yep. that, that, that keep it all to yourself. He, I, I'm finding things out while we were on the interview one day, oh, I used to do this, I used to do that. So you played in an actual band and, and traveled around and made money as a drummer. Get, mm -hmm. get, tell us about that. Yeah, that, that, that was funny, because uh, I used to, I actually taught myself how to play drums. Uh. <laughs> and and uh, my uncle. Well, let me, let me stop you right there. Do you believe in formal training at all, or you feel it's a waste if you can do it yourself? I feel it's a waste if you can do it yourself. Nothing against it. Uh -huh. I got respect for it, but <laughs> me, I'm, I'm just so used to doing things on, you know, on, on my own. You know, you know. Okay. No disrespect to the the schools out there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I just, I'm just so used to doing things on my own. I, I see, I see. So yes, go ahead, continue with the, yeah. uh, the band. And, and, and I, I was, uh, you know, I had done got real good at playing the drums and mm -hmm. my uncle was, my uncle already belonged to this band. What was the name of the band? I forgot, I forgot the name of the band that my uncle belonged to, but they were good, man. Uh -huh. Man, they were good. And, and they used to always have them playing on every holiday, they would have them uh, performing and playing at different locations and stuff. And it just so happened this time that their drummer was sick and, and they needed a replacement drummer. And my uncle thought about me, so he asked me to come down and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, I had one day to get prepared for it. So I, they, we went over the song that we had to play and once, once this group heard me, the other drummer was done. They, 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 you know, they, they, uh, you know I, I feel kind of bad for him <laughs> because they wanted me to be their drum, but I wasn't old enough. Uh, how old were you? Uh, yeah, I, back, back then I was only 16, 16 okay. going on 17, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so they made me their main drummer, mm -hmm. and, and when we started playing in these different clubs, actually I wasn't old enough to get in these clubs, but they, they, let, they let me play there anyway, I was, I was 17 then. You know. So, so in that <clears throat> So now, the most obvious question is why didn't you pursue a career in music? Because martial arts came along, uh, Bruce changed all of that. Okay. Uh, we started from the Green Hornet on up, that, yeah, it, it changed. Green right Hornet? Yep. Yeah. Man, that's a Kato. Yep. And, and uh, one yeah. of the last places I played at was Ernie D's Campus Ballroom. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. Yep, but yep, yep. Man. I worked at the Burger King right yep. across the street. Yeah, I did a lot of uh, uh, I did a lot of uh, things. Yeah, I played that quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. So you segue from one art form to another, the martial arts, and now getting into the formation of how did you know you wanted to make movies, and what made you stick to this you know general area of action movies? Mm -hmm. it, well, even doing even doing when I was playing drums, I always knew I wanted to uh, get into movies because you know, like I said before, it come from me watching James Cagney. Cagney and, and uh, all the all the legendary actors from back in the day. Oh, even when I was playing drums, I still wanted to get into movies. It never it never left. It was still in me. So you know, your first foray in the movies, I, I I heard didn't go as well. You were working um, as well. You worked on someone else's movie in the beginning. Well, what script. it was, I had I had wrote a script called okay. Rage of Justice. Okay. And I didn't have the, the the correct movie camera I needed to shoot the film. So. I had a I had a friend that that did have the camera, that did have the camera that that we needed. So he knew he knew about my not because I had showed him about how fight scenes and everything go. So he was more than happy to shoot the film. So I, I took the film to him. He read you know he read the script and he and, and we uh we I went and had the casting call and and we started shooting and I was he you know I was in charge of doing the fight scenes. Well once we started doing the fight scenes, he didn't want to take the time to shoot all the angles that need to be shot for a fight scene, you know, and, and 
When you say, now, now what do you mean by shooting all the angles? Yeah. Break, it, elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. When you're shooting a fight scene, there are certain angles that have to be shot in order to make the scene look believable. Okay. Uh, you can't just shoot this one, a front shot and a back shot and, and show somebody throwing a punch or either just get a wide shot and, and just show somebody throwing a punch or a kick or something and just call it a day. And that's what that's pretty much what he wanted to do. Man. So, what, so you go a little deeper. You mean like you got to shoot a close up, a wide shot? Yeah. You got to then edit it all together where mm -hmm. it looks like a seamless um, yep. fight. You got to get a you got to get a close up shot. You got to get a medium close up. Then you got to show somebody throwing a, a front kick. You got to you got to show them getting ready to do that front kick. You and and uh, when they get ready to do it, then you cut it right there. Okay. Then you got to show the kick uh, being done. Then you got to show the person being being able to take that you know take that kick. Okay. All that, all those different uh, shots got to be done in order to make a fight scene look believable, in order to pull a fight scene off. He didn't want to do that. Because it was time consuming? Or yeah, it was time consuming. Oh, oh, okay. And he didn't like the idea of it because it was time consuming. So um, when, you know, he, he said he's going to, since it's, it's his equipment, you know, it's his equipment, he's going to do it his way. And, you know, and I told him, I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Since uh, since you want to, since you want to do it your way, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you just have this. I, I'm just... I'm gonna take my script and I'll get somebody else to make it. He said, "Well, you can't do that because I didn't copyright it." I said, "Oh, you, oh, did you?" See, oh, Hardy, he took your script and put it and put it in his name. Mm -hmm. So that's from the business end of things. That yeah. Now you learn from that. I learned from that. Yes, that he took your original idea that you had took time to write. I'm just mm -hmm. making it clear for the audience. Mm -hmm. He took your script and he went ahead and copyrighted it in his name, which prevented you from doing anything with that script. Yep. Okay. So. And, and, and so I told him, I said, okay, I'll tell you what, you keep that script, I'll write another one. Mm -hmm. Because he may have took the script, but he didn't take this. I still got this right here, so uh -huh. I know I can write another one. And the next day I called all, all the people that were in the movie. You know, I called a meeting with all of them because I'm the one that, that uh, did, the, did the casting and got, and got all the actors for, this, for the film. So I called all of them and let them know that I was parting ways and that me and the producer didn't see eye to eye, you know, and I was parting ways, you know, and I told them to go ahead and finish up the film and I wish all of them the best of luck. The very next day, I didn't know this, the very next day, yeah. they walked. Every, all of them walked. They, and and, and I didn't know that. I had heard about it. They, they all walked. They said if I wasn't there, they wasn't going to finish it. So that was the first inkling you knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. First thought you would sit back and say, "Wow." I mean, well, how, I mean, how did you feel when you heard that? I, 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 it made me feel good. Oh, okay. You know, I I, uh, I kind of felt bad for him mm -hmm. because I I didn't plan for nothing like that to happen, but it, it shocked me. But it made me feel good in a way too that that they believed in what I was doing. Okay. Uh, and that's how. Uncut was born. You know, I said I, that's when I came up with the idea for Uncut, and and I told Chris to, to you know to I wanted him to I wanted to, him to come down to the casting, you know, uh, and and uh, that during the time when I met you. Now that's what I'm about to ask because at the time again uh, we met. You were the cameraman at Comcast mm -hmm. on a public access channel called. Um, Homegrown in Detroit with Vanessa Chubb. Mm -hmm. And that was just one of them. That was just one of the. Uh, shows that I was that I was helping to direct and produce because they uh, once they found out that not and it was funny because I had went there just to get when I when I made up my mind I wanted to do a film right okay I had I know I needed to get some paperwork to to put behind my name so credential so you'd be yeah. taking more seriously yeah okay yeah. And, and and that's the reason I went there but once they seen the knowledge that I had then I started getting phone calls from them to come down and do yeah. this and do that and do this and do that and and one of the main people down there that was in charge down there, which was Charles Henry, no relation, by the way. Oh, oh okay. Um, he, uh, he decided he wanted to work with me on, 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 on some projects. So that's when him and I hooked up, and, and I, I got him to be one of my camera persons, but, you know, when I started shooting my films. Pull, pull up just a little mm -hmm. keep it. So, so and by the way, Charles is a martial artist as well. Yep. Okay, so, and so the love of martial arts is what you, I guess, well, let, let me put words in my mouth, but you and him would talk about martial arts movies? Yep. or So in that sense, now, we have the beginning of what you want to do, what's called Uncut. Now, I tell everybody, because I always say, when I see my interview, on Comcast, I, I'm just so embarrassed uh, at how frenetic and how I look like I'm conducting an orchestra. Tell, tell folks about that because you oh. saw it from a different angle. Oh, it's funny. 
Because I've seen, I've seen the nervousness, and, and, and you, you couldn't be still, you were jittery. And, and uh, you know, I would tell the, you know, I would tell the camera person to, uh, to tell him we need him to relax, you know, because I was working in the booth. So I had, I was able to talk to all the camera people to let them know. And I would, I would tell them to tell, you know, to let you know to, to you know, to calm down. You, you know, you're moving too much. Yeah, that was yeah. my first time ever being interviewed. And, I, and, and Vanessa Chubb, the hostess, she had found out about my background in music, you know, working with the Rolling Stones, Aretha, Nita Baker. Oh, we got to interview you. And so I was like, I was surprised because I was down there with someone else I was working with. Um, and so when she heard about my background, she asked to interview me and I was totally taken off guard because I hadn't planned on it, prepared for it, and never wanted to be in front of the camera. I don't, I know, this, this is a face made for radio. But she... She did great, and the sense that I'm, just, and I, when, I was, when I saw the tape, it looked like again I'm conducting an orchestra, and and you didn't tell me but years later, y'all in the booth laughing. Oh, <laughs> oh, I had a field day. You you made my day that yeah. day. I haven't had it to you. I had a field day laughing. I've never been able to watch that tape but once <laughs> at all. So now the thing with the when afterwards when you heard me being interviewed, you came up to me. And what happened from there? Yep, I think I pitched the idea about the. About the movie, yeah, uh, I was giving you my ideas yeah. about what I wanted to do. Because you heard I worked at a studio, yep. and you had said, here, because my background, and so you came up to me, and that's how we, you introduced yourself to me, mm -hmm. and, and it, take it from there. Yep, and, and uh, when you told me about you, had, you know, I, I had heard about you in the studio, and I had told you about my, my ideas, what I wanted to do and everything. I didn't know how seriously you was going to take it or not, <laughs> but I was hoping that you took it serious, what I was trying to tell you, and you did. Yeah. Yep. But like, like I said, I was skeptical because I've heard, I've had so many people um, who basically say they want to get into this, but they won't take the next step. I, I could have got someone in Eminem's movie, Eight Mile. They never showed up for the set. I could have had people in the studio singing. They wouldn't come down. Or they'd show up, one person showed up three hours late. So I always say they're not serious. Mm -hmm. So when you approach me, I, like I said, I never want to say negative things or talk down on someone's dream. So I gave you my card to say, if you ever need my help, call me. Mm -hmm. I never thought you would really take it up. I just said, I'm going to make sure I do my part and say, I'm there if you need me. And then, how long after? Three months later or so? Oh, three months later after and, and you call, finished. Yes. And, and you called out the clear blue. Go, go tell that story. Cause <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. But yep. Because I, when I told you that I had, you know, I had a script and I wanted to do a casting there and and uh, I can't remember what all I, I said to you that day. But you said, could, I, could you use one of the studios? Yep. Could you use a studio? We had three studios. This is right. the disc studios at East Point. And I was teaching there. Now, I, in the disc, they have an institute, a recording institute of Detroit, where I taught music business. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was three studios in there. One was reserved for students. Real small studio. The other was much bigger. Put a whole orchestra in some of them. So when you call me, you say, well, I have a casting. Can we come down? You say, if I ever needed your help. Call you. Oh yeah, yeah. Come on down. And I'm thinking ten people will show up or so, and you're gonna do a little table read, and I can sit and you know write tests for the class and get on back to my business. But what happened? Yeah, man. We had we had hundreds of people show up yes. that day, and and um, if the line was getting real long. We had people in two rooms because I had, I had I had the rooms divided. One room was for the read, where people can practice their reading. The other room we used for for them, you know, for me to take them while they're reading their lines. Right. You know, and, and it was funny, and then I got scared because I I thought I didn't want I didn't want you getting in trouble because of all the people coming, and, that's, and that's, they were steady coming. Yes, and see the times so that you you glossed over this really really quickly. You had hundreds of people coming down for how much money? None. None. Say it. Say it again, please. Yep. There was no budget on this movie. No budget. And you Zero. let the folks know, and hundreds showed up. Yep. And this was this was when I said I'm all here. Way, all the way from Ohio. Well, Someone came yes. from Ohio. One guy came with his modeling agency. What did he say? Told me I could use all of his models. <laughs> exactly what he told me. I, could, yeah, I said, I'm in. Models. Models. I, I said, I'm in. in. I got, oh yeah, he getting the models yeah. too. But the thing was, no budget on this movie. How did you just have the, the boldness? I'm going to say something. How did you have the boldness to sit back and say, hey, look, everybody, I'm not paying you. Can you be in my movie? I mean, I, I, I believe in being real with people, you know, just, just being honest with them. Okay. And and uh, try to get them to believe in my vision. Okay. Yep, and, and it, it, it worked. Now, now, of all of the people, you said a couple of hundred did show up. How many said when, there's no money, when they found out there was no money? How many walked? None. None. Zero. Okay. You did yeah. some hell of a convincing. And, then, and then, uh, <laughs> then, I, then I got the limousine company. 
to come aboard. Okay. And they let me use the limos free of charge. For what? For what? Even the even the driver. Uh -huh. Even let me use his driver, limo driver. So this is this again your very first movie. Mm -hmm. You got you you are so so you I'm, I'm gonna back you up a little bit. You you, you have a scene in the movie in which limousines or or as a big shot boss he's riding the limousine, mm -hmm. and you said, well we need a limo, and you just out of the clear blue said, I'll just come to this company and that. What what gave you? How did that happen? Well, I had met I had met this this, this well known guy named Greg Russell, mm -hmm. and and. Uh, and oh, that's like right. Greg Russell. He's yep. a local news a local news reporter. He's an entertainment reporter here in that's Detroit. In Detroit, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, there's not a there's not a there's not a, a big time actor that he hasn't interviewed, by the way. With his movie review show. Yes. Okay. I think it was movie show plus the movie show plus. And he's still doing that to this day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He helped out in that aspect because he told me he knows it because I was looking for a limo company and he told me about the limo company to go talk with this guy. Okay. And once I went and talked with the guy and, and, and gave him my vision, he was all in. All he asked for was, was two tickets to the premiere. So, so that's how, again, you had no money to pay for this limo that normally would have cost $100, 200 an hour. An hour. And yeah. you had the nerve to walk up to him and say, can I borrow your limo? Yep. <laughs> and, and, and he just said, okay. You know. So that's it. So not just limousine companies, you've had the use or the offer of the use of the actual courthouse in downtown Detroit. Yep, yep, and, and, and uh, told me... 36th District Court. Yep, okay. told me if I need it, if I need the, uh, the courthouse, I could, I could get it. Okay. Rear charge. And, okay. and uh, this, now, this was, that, that blew me away. Now, hold on, this was not Greg Russell doing it, this was another person who offered, yes. that was, uh, who was that? Yes, an uh, uh, attorney named Todd Perkins. Okay. Yep, good friend of mine, yep, he, uh, yep, he, he, he came through big time, not only did he uh, get that for me, but he also got the got the club. The ready. actual club. That's what I want to ask. The actual club is in Hamtramck. It was um, Albanian club. Mm -hmm. Albanian nightclub. Mm -hmm. And 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 we shot there over a period of like two months, I think. Yeah, or more. Oh yes, or more. And every time we were there, we had the whole club to ourselves. Ourselves. And how much did it cost you? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. All I did was talk to people to make sure they buy drinks. Okay. You know, buy drinks while they're there. But and they you, let me they let me have, they let me use a club for, for zero. You had so you had actors working for free. You had club owners giving you a free club, the limousine companies. Um you had, what else? I mean, some of the things that just amazing and what and, and what you had gotten for this oh, movie. And, and the the clothing line. The clothing oh, yeah. The, 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 oh yes, definitely gotta give a shout out to that. Talk yep. about that. Yep. Friend of mine, Clark Proctor, uh -huh. uh, he had a clothing line. So I had went to him and talked with him about the his clothing, clothing line. Is? And the clothing line was the city. The, the, the city. Okay. Yep. And I had went and talked with him about that and, and uh, you know, talking about the clothing line. Would he be willing to put his clothing line in the movie? And he was, he was willing to do it free of charge. What, what time now? I want to all of this because. I mean, when you tell the story, aren't people amazed? Because you just took it in your mind and yeah, yeah, I can just ask them and they're going to let me do this. You know, you never thought about being turned down, or I, I can't even go to them because I'll be rejected. Well, I, I had <laughs> came to the conclusion that, you know, I, I always said it's either be yes or no. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, I'm going to make sure that I give them my vision. Okay. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do, and, and, and they, they seen the vision and they, they came aboard. So, you got, you, how many people were in Uncut, by the way, acting? How many people? Little over, little over two hundred. I mean, speaking when, roles, when extras. Said, yeah, ex speaking okay. roles and extras. Yeah, it was a little over two hundred. And and again, how many of those people were professional actors or had acting experience? Two, two. So everyone else, how did you get them up to the part and playing their part? I held acting classes down at the down at the disc. Okay. I had you know I had told all of them. I, I told them don't worry about the acting. I'm gonna show you how to act. Now now so talk to, talk no no stop don't mm -hmm. lost that over. How did you get someone who says hey Tom I ain't, I ain't no actor. How are you gonna get somebody like that to get in front of the camera and act? What did you yes, say? Sir. What were the I, magical words? I told them everybody's an actor. Okay. When you when you when you're talking I, I asked him I say you got any friends? And he he said yeah and and uh, he or she would say yeah. I say uh, do you talk to them anytime? And, and, and they say, yeah. I said, okay, well, you can act. You know, and I, and I told them, I said, anytime you, you talk with your friends or when you're talking to your parents or when you're talking to anybody, you're acting. You, you know, and so if you could act when you're doing that, you can act on screen. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll show you what to do. Just come down and uh -huh. I'll show you exactly what to do. So I held the acting classes 
and show and showed all of them how to act. And then after that, I, I got a bunch of guys together and I told them I need them to do, none of them know anything about fight change, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so I held, I held my very first stunt camp with them, you know, and, and showed them about the, about the fight scenes and everything. All, it was so, it, it was, all that was new to them, they didn't have a clue about, yeah. about, about any of that. So. But one, again, I, I mentioned Chris earlier. He stood out in the sense, to me at least, that he had took in this this opportunity and ran with it because he came across very well acting as very well fighting and he was just somebody what you did you say hey this is somebody to watch that he's going to go places and everything and all it was the people who stood out other than chris in the movie to you yes who uh the one that the one that uh played the boss man uh, uh, i got yeah i got lucky with him well he was an actual actor he was like yeah he was one of the actual actors okay and how did you find him uh i actually got lucky because the guy that I had playing the boss man the first time, he he fit the scene, but I found out later when I when I gave him his line that he didn't like cussing. He didn't like he didn't like he didn't like uh, uh, cussing words. Okay. And and I told him I said, okay, if you can't do that, you, you're not you, you're not made for this role. This role's not good for you know it's not made for you. Okay. I said you have to do that. He didn't want to do it, so I said, okay, well I'm I'm going to have to replace you because. I need the boss man to be tough. Okay. So uh, along came Sean. I put out another casting for a boss man, and along came Sean. And we said put out a casting. Where where did you put it out? Was this uh, at the time of the internet or what? What, what was email? E email. Yep. I just did. Yep. I just did. E I just did email, and I went through this this uh this this uh acting agency as well. Okay. So I put and I put it. I put the uh, information in. And that's how Sean came aboard. And it was the it was a blessing in disguise because when when Sean came aboard, I, I had read his his uh, his resume, uh -huh. and when he when he read the part, I said, "Oh yeah, All right, here's my boss man." Now, right now, 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 back, now stop right there. Sean is a professional actor. Yes. But you tell him there's no money, mm -hmm. and he said what? And he he said he's, he 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 said he's aboard. And, okay. and and I got lucky because Sean was already making big money, yes. big commercials and everything. He had he had commercials behind him that he had done for these big companies. And he and he uh, decided to go ahead and do this do this part for me for nothing, and I was shocked. But he he didn't he didn't have a problem with it. Now now in the process of making the movie, I, this is what I had found out. You didn't know anything about editing. No. And how did you how did that come about with you yeah. getting into editing? It's funny because <laughs> uh, because I didn't want to depend because I had that experience with with uh, with the other guy where where I had. Uh, the first film that I had wrote, and when I, I didn't, I didn't want to run into no problem where he was, you know, where, where somebody would say, "Well, if I'm editing, I'm going to do this my way." Oh, you know? okay. So I say, "I'm, I'm going to learn this editing myself." When when I came down to the disc, and you told me about Adobe Premiere, uh -huh. uh, and and uh, I, I I said, "I'm going to let you know that I didn't have a clue." See now, now right there again to to fill the viewers in. I worked also at a video production company called Wayne Risa mm -hmm. and I had made a copy of all the software I couldn't afford mm -hmm. so I knew I would never be able to buy it at the cost that it was so I one day just started making copies that and visual effects and anything and everything and so I had told you hey I got an extra copy if you need it what was the software Adobe Premiere Pro or what I mean what number six 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 Adobe so Premiere this, six bro, Adobe Premiere six and so I gave you a copy I think I gave you a set of videotapes to show you how to work it or whatever Mm -hmm. Or something. It, it was actually two discs. It was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, the, the Adobe Premiere was two discs. I, I didn't have nothing to show me how to work it. Oh, 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 because I know they had a whole set. I had went out and, and back in the day a VHS tape. But now, <laughs> how I learned how to work it, they had they had uh, Adobe Premiere had tapes online. Oh, okay. So features. yes, yes. Yeah. So that was so you went to again. Okay, well, I don't know if it was YouTube. And I, and, and I have to tell you, was it YouTube? Yeah. You I have to tell you, uh, I pretended like I, I knew what, what Adobe Premiere was. When you right. gave it to me, I didn't have a clue. And I'm thinking that, okay, you part of, so here, you doing this, because I had always said, I'm going to one day get into it. And this is a little side story on me. This is how I had started working with the Christian rap artist that we came down to that Comcast show. And we were trying to promote his CD. And I had always said I wanted to learn music video, and I'm going to learn by doing, you know, the guy's name was Legion. I'm going to learn to do Legion's video. And so all this video software and all this video production equipment 
we started shooting Legion video, and I said I had Adobe Premiere, and I had made copies. And as I said, I, when, when you and I started talking and we met, I said, I have another copy. Do would you like it? And I had no idea you didn't know what it was. Yeah. None. Because you, you didn't say a word. You just, oh, yeah, yeah, you took, you said you took it. In other words, I didn't think twice in that sense. But you, what happened after that? Yeah, I went home and, 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 uh, and got on YouTube. Uh -huh. And, and uh, yeah. I said, now is my, I, this is my chance to learn about editing. Yes. Didn't let you know that one time I didn't have a clue. Right. Didn't, didn't know what it was you gave me. Didn't have a clue what that was. And, and I didn't know that until years later. And yeah, what you were saying. I, I gotta admit, I played that one off. Yeah, yeah, you, you were very secretive. You got your little ninja skills type of thing. So you, so not only that, you learned now, that was Adobe Premiere 6. What version are you up to now in 2021? 20. Number 20. So you have been through every version of Pro Tools since number 6. Yep. And now you basically have, have you, would you consider yourself a master of, of Adobe? Mm -hmm. of, okay, of, of Premiere. Because not only that, what else have you in the, the vast um, Adobe arsenal? Have you uh, mastered or uh, taken it upon yourself to learn? Uh, Adobe After Effects. Okay. Which which actually yeah which actually complements Adobe Premiere, and and Adobe got a whole bunch of other uh, programs that they came out with. So I got the whole arsenal now. So so not again you 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 go you just glossing over it again. I gotta slow you down to talk about it. not only just the, the Adobe After Effects, Photoshop. Photoshop. You learn how to do graphics. Mm -hmm. You and then making posters and and, and, and ah, uh, good question about that about about Photoshop. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that uh -huh. because um, when when Uncut when we were getting ready to come out with Uncut, I had a guy. I didn't have a clue how to do a poster, so there was a guy that I had got to ask him about doing a poster for me. So he did a poster. Well, I didn't like the poster because the poster didn't have the main people on there that should have been on there. And and I, I told I told him that I needed him to put the you know the main characters on there. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't want to do it. He wanted the he wanted the poster to be what he wanted. His to, yeah, yeah, okay. he, yeah, yeah. He, he he wanted it to be in his whatever vision he had. That's the way he wanted the poster to be. I'll say, okay, well, I tell you what, <laughs> I'll just do it myself. There's a, there's a recurring thing when you telling folks, I tell you what, I'll do it myself. <laughs> hey, I'm noticing that. So you learn, you had to teach yourself. Mm -hmm. Adobe, what Adobe Photoshop? What's it called? Yep. Okay. Adobe Photoshop. So, yeah. so now didn't have, didn't have a clue uh, what it was. Uh, <laughs> so I had to go back to school on YouTube okay. and, and learn it. Now, oh yeah. And so and learning that now, but I, I don't want to jump too far ahead. I'm gonna get right back into that. But not only did you learn Adobe Photoshop, you learned about music and music libraries because yeah. why? Because because we were having. Different people come in because I wanted to showcase a lot of music okay. talent. The first, first let's, again, Uncut, what was the, the, the plot of Uncut and why was music so important? What was the plot? One of the main plots of Uncut is what I wanted, I had this vision of showcasing the music talent here in Detroit. Okay. And that was my vision of showcasing, the, you know, you know, to showcase the music talent here. And that was one of the reasons for Uncut, the uh -huh. club Uncut. And but, club, it was called the, the club you got the Albanians to let you use was an actual nightclub. Mm -hmm. You renamed it Club Uncut for the movie, and that's what the movie was about. Mm -hmm. And it dealt with well, go ahead, you explain. Yeah. It. it dealt with t uh, different talents. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, all these different talents coming into this main club to perform. Okay. And as well as well as music, as, you know, music as well. You know, so mm -hmm. um, once I seen that the music wasn't up the party where I really wanted, you know, it, I couldn't get the music that I really needed because everybody thought the music was cool. Yeah. But, you know, I, I used to always tell them, it's cool to you, but the audience may not accept it. That's what, they, that's what people don't understand. Uh, you got your music and then you got your audience music, what, what, what uh, the audience uh, would accept or they won't accept. Right, right. And, and then you got your underground music, which, which can only go so far. And, and there were certain scenes that I needed music for. And then I would have rap, you know, rappers come to me and bring me their songs with the lyrics on there. And when I hear it, I, you know, I just shake my head. You know, I tell them, I say, to me, you know, they say, Tom, this is, this is cool, man. This is cool. And yeah, I, you know, and I always tell them, I say, it's cool to you. Mm -hmm. And I say, it, it won't work in the scene. And it, and it, and it won't go anywhere. It, you know, they, they, they couldn't seem to get it through the head that you got your underground music right. and then you got your music for the whole world to hear. Okay. And you got to separate the two. So 
once I found out, which was, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, when I didn't get the music that I was looking for for my movie, mm -hmm. then, I, then I started soul searching. Now, the other thing that happened is that you would have original music written for the scenes or written for the night, because could, you couldn't use someone else. You couldn't go in there and just play a Motown song or the current right. thing on the radio because there were certain rights you would mm -hmm. have to acquire, and those rights cost money. So every piece of music had to be original. Mm -hmm. So you ran into the problem of you would have people write music, and what would happen then? What, what, what would go down? Oh man, uh, then they, they would have problems thinking that somebody's going to steal their music, and yes. oh my goodness, I can't even... I can't even uh, well, tell me about the okay. scene. You were about to shoot a scene, and there was three writers on the scene, on the song. There was a singer, the, the, the musician, and then there was a co-writer who did the lyrics. And all three had come together to write the song and was going to sign it over for you to uh, have in the movie. What happened on the day yeah. of shooting? Yeah. I think it's when, the, when his, when I think his nephew or somebody... One came, of the songwriters' nephew. Yeah, uh -huh. came, came down and then he got in his ear and told him that I was going to steal his music. And, and I told him, I said, I say, hey man, how, how am I going to steal your music? You, 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 you signed a contract. I mean, you, you, I mean, you, you, you signed, giving yourself the rights to that particular music. He signed it, you know, he signed the, uh, the paper for that. Uh -huh. So I said, there's no way I could steal your music. So, so uh, he, he got to really believe it. I mean, the guy really got in his ear and, and had him thinking that I was going to steal his music. Uh -huh. And it's a shame because the music was good, the lyrics and everything. So once he got to believe in that and, and thinking that uh, I was going to steal his music, I told him, I said, I'll tell you what you do. <laughs> you keep your music. But this is like the day of shooting, the day you're supposed to shoot the scene. Yeah. Literally, the day, the same, like minutes before you were about to say roll camera. Because all three writers had to sign off in order for you to use the music. Two mm -hmm. said no problem, and the third one is the one that said, I think you're going to steal it or I got right. issues. So mm -hmm. you couldn't use it unless all three, it was all in writing. Right. So the day of the shoot, minutes, seconds, literally, before you about to hit record, he said, I'm not doing it. Yeah. So, so again, how, how, did, how did that make you feel at the time? Oh, I, I was very, I, I was, I was very ticked off. Uh -huh. uh, but you would never see it. Yeah. I yeah. would never <laughs> let anybody see it. The dragon see it when was calm. And I was ticked off. <laughs> I would always keep that hidden. Uh, but then, how did I, I was ticked off and I was disappointed. Mm. Because you, you got the paper right there saying that you own the rights to that right. music. And, and that's the one thing that I always give you credit for. You you want to turn me on to that. To the business like, and yeah. the music. So yeah. yeah, so you don't do something that's going to bite your ass later down the road, get yeah. sued for something. I'm going to told you about, oh, you just can't take a song off the radio and redo it and put it in your, in your music, mm -hmm. in your movie. Um, so, so that's, again, those types of headaches and problems and even things... Because the first movie, I was not involved in it as much as the other two. I think you had me do one little cameo role. Yeah. And ever since, again, Denzel has sent me death threats. By <laughs> <laughs> but it was um, things and headaches that I may be not even aware of. And, and give an idea of what it was like in, in the early days oh, of doing that movie. Uh, How long did it take to shoot, by the way? Th three years. Three years? Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, it took three years to shoot that movie because I ran into a whole bunch of headaches. Like what? Uh, for one, the, the, the lady that played the lead lady, I had this, I had this uh, remarkable dancer that was playing the lead lady. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, for some reason, you know, that, 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 that didn't work out because, you know, she, she got uncomfortable once, once her boyfriend got on the set. So, because of why? What, what, what made her uncomfortable? What made her feel like she can't do this if her boyfriend is there? He didn't like the idea of, of the kissing scene. Okay. And, and I had okay. asked. She is, she's a, what is her role? Let's give a little context she, for she that. Was the, she was the girlfriend of, of the main actor, uh, which was Chris. And he was, she was a B. She, she, she was going to be, you know, she was his girlfriend. Okay, and so yeah. there were going to be love scenes or kissing scenes. Kissing scenes. Mm -hmm. and, she, and, and so when the boyfriend, her real boyfriend, shows up on the set, all of a sudden she, well, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem. All of a sudden then, then she's not comfortable no more. And I had asked in advance, do you have a problem with that? And, and, and he said no, and, and, she, and she said no too. But once the shooting started, uh, I seen it. Uh, you know, that, that's the one thing I do. I don't say much, but I pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I, I watch the face. You know, I was watching the facial expressions. Uh, and, and man, he had, the, he had the meanest look you could ever see. Uh, and, and, and then she was uncomfortable. Okay. She wasn't comfortable no more. So I took both of them. I, I stopped the scene. 
I took both of them and, and uh, I went and had a talk with both of them and I told them, I said, this, this is not going to work. Uh, because I, I could see that you you don't really like what's going on here. Oh no, Tom, I'm professional. I said no, no, I could see it. Uh, so I'm on, I'm I'm gonna put a stop to this now before it get out of hand. Okay. So, right. <laughs> and that's when I had to recast for uh, the girl, you know, for the girlfriend to play Chris's girlfriend. Okay. So uh, other, other issues that came up. Oh man, uh, there there were plenty uh, with actors. I had to replay. There were actors not showing up like they're supposed to. It, 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 it was a headache, and, and then uh, uh, when I thought that uh, certain things were going to get done on a particular day, they didn't get done, you know, because you know, sometimes actors are short, sometimes they won't, you know, so by, by actors not getting paid, I had to go along with that. Because their real job might call. Right. Or, or... Yep. No, no, I, hear, I always ask this, and um, what kept you going through all of these headaches? I mean, I've been on set with you. We're ready to shoot. Everything is set up. It took hours to do the lights. All of the people have stopped their job. One person doesn't show up, which throws the entire set off. What What made you not just throw in the towel and just say, the hell with this. Let me, let me go back to drumming or something. Motivation. What? What? what, what I, had that, I had that motivation. I was determined to get it done. No, no stop. Right there. First and foremost, you, you, you have a wife at home, Linda, and I got to give her a props in that sense. That, that is your, that, that, that alleviates, I'm assuming, a lot of pressure because you, unlike my little bachelor self, you don't have to worry about going home to cook or do the laundry or the little mundane thing. So you are free, freed up to do the things you want, like stay up all night learning you, uh, um, Adobe Premiere. So we gotta give her props in that sense. But what else? What was the motivating factor? It just to be able to say, I, I, I can't do this, or I, I can continue on it tomorrow. Yeah, I never, I never uh, uh, gave up. I never seen, seen. I just never let that got into my mind that it couldn't be done. When I see that one thing is not working, then I figure out another way to get it done. But so many people, Tom, have started out and stop. And see, the thing, the difference, the main difference of making a movie and making an album, I can do an album by myself. Like I told you, like with Prince, he can play mm -hmm. every instrument. My little songwriting studio we're in, mm -hmm. I can play every instrument, keyboard, bass, drum, all of that myself. And I don't have to interact with anyone until it's time to go on the road and I got to hire a band to play because I can't play them all at one time. Mm -hmm. So I have that option that when someone get on my nerves, I can say, I, I do it myself. You know, literally kick them out and just play it. You can't do that with a movie because you can't run, hit the button, and run in front of the camera. So, I mean, trying to, it's like like herding kittens, they call it. You know, you're trying to keep everybody, but everybody want to go their own little separate way. That never got frustrating. Oh, yeah, it got frustrating, but once again, I never showed it. Okay. Uh, I, got, I got frustrated plenty of times, but I never showed it. And I think one of the hardest things for me to, to do was to set up a scene for myself. I, I was going to ask that because you are, you are in the movie as well. Mm -hmm. um, your character, I'm going to say, it's not, what's your character? I'm going to say John my, T. My character in the film was something like a teacher. Okay. Uh, a teacher and a motivator. I was, I was, I was teaching the lead actor, which was Chris. I would teach him and, 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 and change his thought pattern of thinking. When we say teaching him back on the right path. In the movie, you're teaching him what? Martial arts. So, because of why? Because he got he got off the path that he was on, uh, once he once he got once he uh, got things going for himself, and and got well known, then he got off the path that he was on and started and started getting out there in the street, with the street you know he started doing street thinking instead of staying on the path. So because because again uncut dealt with first of all the club uncut Chris what was Chris's character. Um, borrows money to open the club because no one else would lend him the money. Mm -hmm. So he goes to the mob at Loan Shark. Mm -hmm. And they lend him the money and say we want X amount plus back. Mm -hmm. Now when Chris's club becomes so popular, club uncut in the movie, the mob says no, we don't want our money back. We want to become your new partner. Yep. Welcome aboard, partner. And Chris, no, no, I don't need a partner. And that's where the trouble begins. So that's where he has to fight the mob, and your character comes into play. Mm -hmm. So that that was the issue. But they had a lot of action, a lot of music, and again, I thought Chris's acting was top notch. Um, and so your character in the movie, you know, again, and, 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 and you know, speaking of that, mm -hmm. he he took him in because he he said that at the auditions he sucked, <laughs> and, and he did, and he no, did. I'm laughing because I remind me, you remind me what I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and 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 he did. He he, he sucked in the audition, but mm -hmm. I knew what he was capable of doing. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, I, you know, after the audition was over, because he, he had his head down, felt, you know, his feeling bad and everything. I went and talked with him. Uh, I told him, I said, listen, man, I know what you're capable. Of, I know what you're capable of doing. I said, don't worry about it. I got you. And and, and uh, you know, I, I worked with him and told him to calm down and be more natural. You know, I told him to calm down and and, and be natural. That's all you gotta do. You know, you're, you're trying to act instead of just being natural. Be natural. Okay. And uh, right after that, that's all it took because one of the worst, let me, let me tell you, one of the worst actors that was in the movie was J Dog. Ooh, Clark I, Proctor. I, I thought he was going to say me. No. <laughs> yeah, Clark Proctor. He, okay. was, he was terrible. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. He was terrible. And all I had to do was talk to him one time. That's all it took. Uh -huh. Because he was so he, he was so nervous and generally he was just stumbling over his words. He was he, I mean, he was, he was just, just stumbling over everything, saying everything over and over again. It, it, he, he was terrible. Uh -huh. So I got him, took him to the side and told him, I said, listen, man, all you got to do is relax and take it easy. And don't worry about acting. Forget about that camera uh -huh. and be That's natural. Great. It's like you're talking to one of your friends. Uh -huh. Once I told him to forget about that camera being in front of him, then all of a sudden the real J-Dog came out. And it came out so much till I was just... I'm like, I was in shock. Uh, it shocked me how he became this, he became j Dog. Because he was a, he was a, like, second, he was a henchman, too. Yeah. Like, second, was, like, a loop, the main henchman, too. Yeah, he was a main Yeah. And, and, man, did he pull it off. Oh, okay. I, I was so proud of him because when you think back to how terrible he was the first time, and then all of a sudden, he became j Dog. Okay. It, it was like Clark just completely disappeared. Okay. You know, it, 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 I was amazed. Now, see, I'm, I'm spending so much time on this first movie because one of the things, again, people need to know, those who want to follow your path, it wasn't like you were handed all of this gift and this talent and woke up one morning and said, yes, this movie will be made. You sat back, it was through trial and error, beating your head against the wall, blood, sweat, tears, a whole nine. And this first movie, because, again, I was not involved with this one as much as the other two. So a lot of the stuff when I had found out, I was just so surprised. Mm -hmm. So let's, I mean, so we talked briefly about the music, but you had, um, we got to get a shout out to Aaron Carl. Talk yes. about the, um, Aaron, the late Aaron Carl, the DJ. Talk about that. How did oh, you get man. him involved? Um, uh, through, through trial and error. So, oh, I, I know now, uh, it was Clark. Mm -hmm. Clark Proctor uh, knew him and, and uh, introduced me to him. And, and uh, we found out that he was a DJ. You know, and, and you know, uh, uh, once I found out he was a DJ, then I, I put my arm on his shoulder <laughs> and went and talked with him and, and talked with him about, about getting involved in the film. And he did the theme song. Yes. Yes. And yeah, he, he, did, yeah, he, he didn't get a chance to put the finishing touches on the theme song. He passed away before, before he was able to put the finishing touches on it. Uh, and and uh, I, that hurt me so bad when I heard that. Yeah. Um, Cause I like that theme song. It was, yeah, it, it, fit it, to it, it, it yes. was the bomb. Yes. Because he, he said, "What kind of music are you looking for?" I say, "I wanted to be tough, and I wanted to be I wanted to be ruthless. I wanted to be cool. Uh -huh. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Sort of. I told him I said, sort of a James Brownish thing. Uh -huh. And that's all I needed to tell him. And, and he did the thing. I, I, I remember the, the the sequence. I first. Heard it in was when uh, Clark's character and them walking up the driveway. They doing this slow motion. Then it speeds mm -hmm. up real quick. Back to slow motion. So uh, again, it, it fit to a T. His songs and all that. Yep, it sure and, did. And we had people also. There was another late actor. And, and, and by the way, um, with, with Clark and them walking up the driveway and and you know they was they were speeding up and everything. That was my first time doing that. <laughs> by the way, and 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 it worked to perfection. That, that was uh, that was my first time practicing that. And, 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 and trying it out, and it worked to perfection. Now, by the way, how long, and I mean, how many hours did you spend learning Adobe Premiere? Oh, man. Would you roughly say, every night? I would say every night, I would say about 13, maybe 15 hours. So, so, so. Or like, more. So, this is why I say, again, a shout out to your wife, a big applause, because you couldn't have been able to do that if you had to stop and worry about the little simple Monday things or running down the heat. Trust me, I know, I hate doing laundry. So I don't even do it yeah. until everything is needed to be watched. So just to be able to have little things in life to take care of it all. So a big shout out to her. So to be able to sit up there all night long and just learn it, learn it, learn it, learn it. And, and, and now, so, so jumping ahead in that sense, the movie is complete. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the cast and crew is thinking, what? Where is this movie going to go? Yeah, well, 
They thought it was going to DVD. Myself included. Yeah. And and uh, the only now, person back in the no, back DVD at the time, wasn't like now the streaming and Netflix and Hulu. DVD, you know, go to the video store. Not even yeah, DVD VHS was VHS. Oh yeah, yeah. VHS was still, still, yeah. VHS was still so you would, you would go to a video store like Blockbuster or mm -hmm. Family Video and mm -hmm. rent the movie. And everybody, myself included, thought this is where you're going to take it. Yeah. So give us your rationale. What happened yeah. next? Never crossed my mind. Okay. Uh, it never crossed my mind about about uh, taking it to DVD. Why? My main purpose uh -huh. was to get it into a theater. Okay. You know, get into the movie theater. I wanted to be like the big boys. Okay. Uh, and and. Uh, <laughs> I never said nothing to nobody. You, you really didn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah cause every, and everybody thought it was going to DVD. Yes. Now, the funny part is when I mentioned it to them, uh -huh. everybody, when I mentioned to everybody that I was going to uh, get to move into the theater, they all laughed at me. I didn't laugh. I was just doubtful. I said, what? Because I didn't know. And I mm -hmm. sat back and said, how? Because I'm thinking, again, I'm waiting to get, I'm going to go to the video store and see it. I'm going to buy my couple of copies and put it on the shelf. Because mm -hmm. that's where I thought, when you said the movie was done, that's when I thought, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But you said, because your, your, I guess your dream, your vision or something as a kid, see it on the big screen. Yeah. And, and so now, and, and so here comes another bit of, of Tom Henry doing the dragon magic. You know, uh, how did you get into the zoo theater, and how how did you get into the theater? That's a story. I got, the, I got the call in every theater I could think of. I got the call. You know, I went I went on the uh, you know I went in the yellow pages. I, I didn't know too much about finding them on the computer. Right yeah, now. Right. I started checking the yellow pages and getting the numbers of all the theaters, and I started calling them, seeing if they would uh, let an independent film uh, get into the you know get into the theater, and what would be the cost. And I found two theaters that actually did it. Uh -huh. You know that that would actually let you do that. And and uh, and I, once I asked what the cost was, uh, uh, you know I found out what the cost was. And one of the theaters that actually did it was the Renaissance downtown. And I said, Oh man, the Renaissance theater. If I can get it in there, how much was it back then? Eight uh, eight hundred. Oh okay. Eight hundred dollars. Okay. And uh, I didn't that. I didn't have a clue. I was going to get that. Yeah, yes, yes. And that was the thing. It didn't also, you didn't have $800. So, <laughs> so that's a double whammy. But yeah. how did you get over that little hurdle that's to this day, as I said, I said, that's, that's the time Henry Ray. Well, how, how, did it, how did you do that? I, I, I can't, I, I thought about it. I said, let me see, how can I get that? Movie? Because again, how can to, I get the money? to give some clarity to the viewers, mm -hmm. you shot a movie with no budget. You didn't, you couldn't even pay the actors if you wanted to. Whatever money was there, you were using it for gas or buying up uh, 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 whatever tape or flash drives for your production. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a couple of times you had donuts, you know. Yep. So you had no money, even if you wanted to pay, you couldn't. You had no money. So mm -hmm. you sat back and you had this bold vision of putting it on the screen with no money. You got a completed film, not going to DVD or VHS, it's going into the theater. So. You had this bold vision to say it's going to go on the screen, and you said, <laughs> "Yep, <laughs> go from there." And 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 uh, <laughs> what I did, I got to think. I said, "How can I get this into the theater?" And then I got to thinking, "Wait a minute! All of these people that's in my film, I can order some. I can order some movie tickets up front, okay, and then get all of them to sell ten tickets a piece because I know they're going to all get their friends to come see them on screen because they've never been on screen before. Uh -huh. So that's what I did. I, I came up with the idea, I went and ordered the tickets, ordered the tickets and I, and I called a meeting with all the actors, I called a meeting with all of them and told them I need all of them to sell 10 tickets a piece uh, to get into it. Once they found out that that, that uh, we really were, Want, uh, want to get into it because I figured I need to show them the movie tickets but, oh, for them to believe. Yes, and, but you didn't say I don't have the theater now, but we're going to sell the tickets in advance. You, mm -hmm. didn't, you didn't say that to me. No. Because I was at the no. meeting. You just said we're selling tickets. Yep. And to everybody assume, like me, oh, it's all reserved. This is the date. You, mm -hmm. you had the date and everything locked in, printed on the tickets, and you was just like, sell tickets. Yep. But if never we, let it, never that, let anybody know uh, that, I did, that I didn't have a theater yet. But if we didn't sell them. enough tickets, you wouldn't have had to do it. So it would have been like you you took a lot a big gamble. I did. You, you, yep. you, that, was a, that was a huge bluff. So everybody went out, sold tickets, and and, and you got the money. Mm -hmm. And oh, and, and now it, it describe the very first time with the premiere of Uncut. What was that like? Oh, walk uh, me through, well, walk us through. Uh, uh, the, the very first let me let me tell you this. Uh, uh, Clark and I had went downtown because 
the Renaissance called me downtown to take a look at everything before before the actual premiere. Uh -huh. And me and Clark went down there, and and uh, and and uh, when I seen when I when they you know they they turned the uh, uncut on, and when I seen myself up on the screen and seen and seen him Clark and and some of the other people on the screen, man, I was I was on cloud nine. I said, oh my God, you know, uh -huh. it, it was like. It's like my body just started floating up off the floor, uh -huh. and and uh, it, it it was it was it was like a high. I'm, I'm floating. I'm not even on the floor no more. Yeah. And and I I didn't even want to leave. Clark 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 was in shock. I was in shock. And and when we got ready to go. So you see it on the big screen. You hear that big theater yeah, sound. All that noise. All that. All yeah. that. All that. All that. Uh, uh, noise, man. The, the sound. Yeah. That oh man, that theater sound, and 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 I'm like, man, I pulled it off. Uh -huh. You know, I was able to. That let me know that I had got everything right, editing wise and everything. Yeah. That was my first time editing. So you, you, you know, as you describe it now, it reminds me of that scene in the Five Heartbeats when they hear that song on the radio for the first time. Mm -hmm. They're laying in bed and everybody just jump up, <laughs> screaming, ecstatic. They can't believe they made it to in their mind. It being on the radio means you made it. Yep. Seeing your image on the big screen. It's like, again, it's hard, I don't know, I, I like it that, hey, you're watching your child being born or something mm -hmm. like that. It, it, you can never take away, so, so walk me through that, because it's yep. an experience that when I finally got there, when the day of the premiere, walk me up from when you had, you and Clark went down there to the day of the premiere. Well, let me tell you, uh, it was like Clark had to get a rope and, and throw it up there and, 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 and <laughs> latch it around me and, and, and pull me, uh -huh. to get me to get me out of there because I'm still floating, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> he, he had to just pull me to the truck, you know, because, man, I'm still floating, man. I'm, I'm still in a, in, a, in, a, in a maze, you know, that it's there. Uh -huh. you, know, we, you know, we did it, you know. So the day of the premiere, um, everybody, I never thought, you know, I knew I was going to have a lot of people. I never would have thought that we would sell out. Sell out. Not just a sell out, but it was standing room only, only and the theater was bringing in extra yeah. seats. They, they, yeah, the theater had to actually I, go and get extra seats to bring in there. And this when I had walked in and I'm seeing the going back and forth getting seats, my jaw hit the <laughs> ground. Because I said, like I said, we didn't know each other as well as we do now. And I, I sat back and just said, I, how did he do this? He pulled it off again. Because it was something, I remember you had, your, you had that cream colored suit, I think. Yeah. With the little hat, your braids coming out of yep. everything. And I was just sitting there at the back of the audience. Because we walked, not just going into the theater, we walk in, there is media. Greg Russell showed up with a crew, film crew. So you're walking through just like a Hollywood presentation. You walk mm -hmm. to the theater, and I said, damn, I'm looking at all of this. And I said, Tom did it. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting back, and they they just scrambling to get chairs. People yep. are coming. It's like standing up, right, and then you yep. see this big projected image. And I said I was proud. I was impressed. I was proud. And I said, Tom, got to be up there still. So the very first time in all of that in the history book. So that that to me was an amazing feat. Yeah, and 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 just to see, just to see it being a. I sell a lot like that, and then people were asking for autographs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know. So you it made it. it. It you made it. So again, um, oh my goodness. So now we go. Let me see. I'm trying to make sure because I want to go deeper into all the other movies, but this one I wanted to spend so much time on because it was the very first time. What was your next thought after? I guess a couple of days after this premiere. What did you want to do? Keep it going.